John Porter is, um, I would say, a very serendipitous uh, find of mine. I can remember, can't remember exactly which year, but a few years ago, we met at uh, SLMDA dinner dance, I think. That's where we met first. That's correct. And uh, yes, he was on our table. And then we had our chats. And I realized that he's a very, you know, very... Uh, learned guy, not only learned, he's um, he's traveled well. And uh, to summarize what he is, I think he's a jack of all trades and master of most of them as well. <laughs> and my wife sometimes yeah. tell me because we have been in London with John and his partner, who is a Sri Lankan lady. And wherever we go, he knows the history, geography, everything about those monuments. And if I talk about any country in the world, oh, I've been to China, I've been there. John says, oh, do you know that uh, that place? You know, this place, because he's been there as well. It's in a way annoying because he knows everything. But that's the truth, John. Um, so uh, Dr. John Porter has a PhD. And his primary uh, training, I believe, is in IT. Uh, he sent me his biography, which half of which I can't even understand because I'm not in that field. But the more in interesting facts about him would be uh, after his retirement, or I don't know whether you have started your uh, teaching career even before that, but he currently teaches uh, English to... Uh, professionals who are not uh, English speakers. So currently he is in Sri Lanka. Uh, actually, uh, he just finished uh, one of the courses for our Sri Lankan students. So at some stage, uh, after the main topic, I'm going to ask you a few questions about your opinion on uh, Sri Lankan professionals and their English proficiency. How can we make some changes? Uh, to their social interaction skills, etc. John, if you uh, don't mind me asking. Um, so of that's, course, that's, no problem. Thank you, uh, because I've, I've advertised that you would be happy to uh, answer those questions because in our mind, that would be another main area we would like uh, your opinion on. So uh, without much ado, John, the stage is yours. Hey. Okay. Thank you, thank you. So, um, I actually teach communication skills. Um, as we'll talk about later, I teach predominantly to engineers and professional qualifications. So, for example, at University of Matu, oh gosh, at uh, the University of Moratua, I talked on what is a good presentation and how do you handle yourself in discussions with people such as mayors, prime ministers. So I teach predominantly communication skills with the aim of making these students feel confident. So if they're put into a new environment, for example, if they go to a dinner party or if they meet a, a senior person, how do they act? How do they react? How do they handle themselves? So that's what I normally teach at the moment. Historically, I am a program manager, enterprise architect, worked with most of the big companies around the world. Last one was Rolls-Royce in Derby, introducing machine learning into their more advanced computing networks. But I just tend to work around the world. And very fortunately, I'm lucky enough to be in Sri Lanka for a while. Um, I've just finished teaching a course, just finished teaching a two hour class or three hour class to the University of Vocational, um, Un University of Vocational Technologies, Vocational Technologies, um, just a three hour class to their second year undergraduates on basically how to write a technical report. Okay. What as engineers are they expected to have in a technical report. But that's what, what I'm talking about today. Today is a completely, completely different subject and it 
more likely come to a surprise to Ruan as well, because we've never talked about this. And this is something which I've noticed as I've moved around the world. And I've noticed this is the difference between different levels of development in different countries. And the article I want to talk about is science parks. Okay. Um, we all have science parks. We all know science parks. We've all worked in science parks, I suspect. Um, you know, we've all worked in science parks. We see them all the time. But it's a bit like old age. It, they creep up on you. One moment, you see a couple of buildings. And the next moment, you've got lots and lots of science parks with lots and lots of very large companies. Okay. And they have come to dominate the technology world, especially in the UK. Now, what I want to look at is how they came about, why they became so important. And I believe this is fundamental to what's happening in Sri Lanka at the moment. Okay, As many of you may be aware, Sri Lanka lacks science parks of a nature. However, there's a big initiative to to build five new science parks. And the question I want you to look at or think about as I go through this presentation, are these science parks the correct format for Sri Lanka? Or are the institute-based models more suited? And I'll talk through one of these institute-based models, which I know in Sri Lanka. OK, and I want you to think about which is the best model. Are science parks suitable for Sri Lanka? Or should they be promoting these more focused institute based research and development models? OK, so please bear that in mind through the presentation. But first, I want to explain how science parks started, because I am fortunate enough when I'm not in Sri Lanka, to live in Cambridge. Um, I am very fortunate to live in Cambridge. I have a lot of opportunities and it's great. Not least because the access to technology, access to clever people is unlimited. As you know, in Cambridge, we have had 121 Nobel Prize winners since 1904. To put that into context, this is more than any individual country except USA. I repeat, Cambridge has won more Nobel Prizes than any individual country except the USA. The only place which has more uh, Nobel Prizes is our offspring in America, Harvard. Only Harvard has more Nobel Prize winners. Okay. The point I'm making here is that a place can have clever people. It can have a tremendous academic background, but how do we translate that into economic prosperity? How we, do we convert academic power to economic prosperity? So for example, we have a wonderful picture here of somebody who I was very fortunate to meet many years ago. <laughs> Excuse me, Robert Edwards. Robert Edwards, as the doctors among us know, was the pioneer of IVF. OK. Amazing. Technology, amazing. However, how much economic prosperity did that bring to Cambridge? Or to the UK? OK, we might have a lot more babies nowadays. We might have a lot more. <coughs> excuse me. We might have a lot more. Uh, couples who can have children. But has that translated to economic prosperity? OK, and more importantly, economic prosperity for those like me who live 
in Cambridge. Okay. Now, before I start, Cambridge has not always been this great economic powerhouse, Silicon Fen didn't exist. It wasn't the largest technology hub in Europe, except for London. Okay, the largest technology hub in Europe. Okay, and we exclude London because they tend to be more web and finance focused rather than basic exploitation of research and development. So it doesn't really count. But Cambridge has always been at the forefront of technology. So there have been companies in Cambridge which have led the world in new ideas. Here we have, for example, examples of um, the, the Sinclair Micro, the ZX81. You remember, we all remember the ZX Spectrum, etc. And for those of a certain vintage, you remember we used to make the Sinclair kits for hi-fi in the days when hi-fi used to be exorbitantly expensive. Sinclair made these little kits we could put together and we had really good hi-fi systems. In addition, we had companies like Pi. So again, those of a certain age will remember Pi televisions, Pi uh, radio sets, but Pi also was in the professional area. They produced TV, um, professional TV cameras. In fact, one of the first TV cameras uh, for high resolution pictures in 48 was a Pi. And for those who are into mobile communication, Pi was everywhere in the world post-war. Any country you went into, your police force, your ambulances, your army either used Pi mobile radios or Motorola. They were everywhere. Okay. However, not only did they have these great new innovation um, ideas, they were also very capable of exploiting these ideas. Okay. So not just creating the idea, but exploiting the new technology. So let's just listen to a rather interesting old video from British Pathé on initial ideas. So here we can see a very good example of exploiting technologies for new applications. It's what Cambridge has always done. And incidentally, I 
if we are talking about self-driving cars, we actually did have self-driving cars on the Cambridge Science Park way back in um, 19, uh, 2017. So we've actually had automated cars driving around the science parks now for about 25, 26 years. So, you know, people don't realize that these technologies exist and are around. Now, so I've been talking about companies. I've not mentioned the university. Many of these companies were set up by disgruntled, uh, by disgruntled, um, by disgruntled academics who have left the university and set up their own companies. Okay, but in the meantime, Cambridge University was becoming rich, very, very, very rich. And it was doing it by using the ideas of patents and licenses. New idea, they would patent and license the ideas. And believe me, they made a lot of money, which always led me on to, for example, my fa father's continuing moan that we invent so much in the UK and then give it away to the foreigners. So the universities were becoming rich, but the country wasn't exploiting the ideas. So there was a big mismatch between what the universities were doing and what was good for the company. But then came a step change, a big change in the way that Cambridge worked. John, can I just uh, disturb you at this point? Of you know, um, we did not hear the sounds of the, uh, the video clip. Oh what, dear. What you should do, I mean, we, we heard very faintly. What you should do is you should uh, you should go back to unshare. And then when you share the screen, there are two boxes which say... That's no problem, Ron. I'll keep going because it's, yeah. it's not relevant to the story. Yeah, um, but thank you, Rowan. Yes. Yeah. Thank right. you for telling me. Yeah. If we have Thanks. time at the end, because it's lovely looking at Cambridge from the 1950s. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's <laughs> all the old streets, all the old streets. But thank you, Rowan. Thank all you. Right. But I'll keep going now because it's not yeah. relevant. You. Okay. So, okay. So, what happened was this. So coming forward to 2022, here we have all the business parks, research parks, by medical campus within a 30 minute drive from the university. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, there's 14 or 15 business centers, research campuses, science parks, biomedical campuses, they have all grown in the last 40 to 50 years. And they have provided the powerhouse to, for example, Silicon Fen. It has driven UK to the forefront of research, innovation, and exploitation of ideas. Okay, 15. 50 years ago, there were none. 20, 30 years ago, two or three. And what I would like to do now is explain how they developed, okay, how they developed and provided this link between the university and the real commercial world. And a lot of these links are not obvious. And a lot of these links I think you'll find are very beneficial to the later stages of my talk. But first, what is a science park? Like most things in life, we all think we know what a science park is, what a technology park is, what a biocampus park is. But I need to make a clear distinction between a science park and an individual institution with associated industrial activity. So a science park is an organization, okay? It is an organization. 
okay? It needs to be managed by specialized professionals to provide the basic facilities. So the park has to be set up such that the facilities are there to allow R&D startups to work. It cannot be left to chance. Secondly, there has to be innovation in place and exploitation of knowledge. Therefore, this precludes only manufacturing plants or, for example, uh, commercial um, conveyancing plants, uh, logistics plants, etc. Okay, and also it must increase wealth to the community. So therefore, universities, to a degree, provide wealth to the community, but not on the same level. So there's a big distinction here between a science park and an academic institution. Okay. So please bear that in mind as I go through the talk. Now, how important is technology to Cambridge? Okay, we all know it's important. We all understand the importance, okay? But some of these figures hopefully will put it into context. So these figures were a bit old because this was part of a study I was looking at when I was looking into real estate investment trusts way back in the late uh, 2018, 2020 period. So figures are slightly old, but they give you the general idea. At that time, Cambridge, and I repeat, Cambridge on its own was turning over £2.4 billion a year. £2.4 billion a year. To put that into contents, context, sorry, the UK economy is three trillion pounds. Three trillion pounds. So 0.1% of the economy was attributed to technology in Cambridge. Yes, 0.1% of the economy can be attributed to these few technology companies in Cambridge. Each employee at these sites was contributing approximately £152,000 a year to the economy. Bringing that into, bringing that into uh, context again, the UK economy has about 184 billion pounds uh, provided from technology companies. Okay, yes. So that's approximately 6% of our economy is based on the R&D technology. And the whole sector at the time was expanding about two and a half times faster than the rest of the economy. So it gives you a general idea of just how important technology is. And these figures do not include support or ancillary commercial activities such as, you know, things like supermarket car dealers, you know, coffee baristas, sandwich makers and people like that. So it's obviously important, obviously important, not only reputational, but also economically. OK, so how did they start? The best place to start would be in 1964. Before most of, a, most of you were born, I remember 1964, and the Labour government was short of money. The country was in a very bad state. We needed money. So they had this initiative to realize their funding research. What they wanted to do was exploit the money which they were spending on basic academic research. In other words, what they were saying was, if we don't get a return on our investment for universities, we are going to stop funding you. It was a threat, basically. Positive spin, we're realizing 
reality spin, we're threatening your funding. You either give us a good return or we cut it. In response, Cambridge University set up the MOT committee. Um, MOT is Professor Sir, uh, Professor Sir Neville Mott. Now, Professor Sir Neville Mott was uh, the Cavendish Professor of Experimental Physics. He's not a businessman, he's not a commercial operator. He is the Cavendish Professor of Experimental Physics. Just think about that, okay? But he was able to drive through this new plan. And his eureka moment was looking at the science parks from Stanford University. And he was able, through his influence in the university, to persuade Trinity College. So those who know Cambridge, I'm not too sure how many on the call are familiar with our friends in um, in our friends in uh, came, uh, universities in Cambridge, but Trinity College is immensely rich. Okay, it is rich. On its own, Trinity College is the fifth richest charity in the UK. It has ongoing assets of well over two billion pounds. It is rich. It's also the posh college. It's where the posh people go. For those who know. Cambridge University. Well, they had land to the northwest of Cambridge and they used their wealth and power to set up or to apply for planning permission to start a science park. So their plan was put in place and planning permission was granted in 1971. And the first company moved in in 1973 a company called LaserScan. Now, you'll see this is a repeated pattern. Slow start, six to seven years between idea and implementation. But once the component pieces are in place, it's fast. So within two years of getting the planning permission, they got the first company in. So this is a repeated pattern. Slow burn start, but once operational, things move fast. And the first company in, as we can see here, is LaserScan. And I'd like to take a few minutes to look at LaserScan, and it gives you the idea of the kind of company which was um, in place. Okay. So LaserScan was founded in 1989. Okay, so it was founded a little bit of, um, after the um, yeah after the science parks were started, but that's just the name. Okay, so site laser scan was founded by three academics who were still in the physics department of Cambridge University. Uh, and the one person all of you physicists will know is Otto Robert Frisch. Otto Robert Frisch was one of the founders of this company, LaserScan. So Otto Frisch, as you physicists will know, was the gentleman who created the terms chain reaction and nuclear fission. And he basically laid down the principles for things like the atomic bomb and nuclear power. But so we are talking about very, very competent and well, uh, very competent and academically superior people. So we're not just talking about commercial operators. We're not two people exploiting. We are talking about some very serious academic staff here. What they did in their laboratory was to create a machine called Sweepnik, which used laser beams and mirrors 
to follow lines on photographs. And the photographs they were looking at were for bubble chambers. So they were looking for elementary particles, you know, protons, neutrons, etc. And they were trying to find them and track them. They sold this idea to other bubble chambers around the world, France, America, Belgium, etc. They sold the idea. However, their eureka moment was realizing that they weren't the only people who wanted to track detail on photographs or on diagrams. What, so what they developed was something known as the HRD1 display plotter, which is that weird uh, with the young lady in the bottom picture. And this technology was then used by cartographers when they're making maps. So rather than get, having to get loads of people to come and lay tracing paper and those kinds of ideas down, remember we're talking before computers here, they could use the same equipment to recreate maps and technical drawings. That was their eureka moment. They realized that some basic academic apparatus had a very big role in the commercial world. So that was laser scan, okay? So it gives you an idea of how we can move academic ideas to be a very big commercial opportunity, okay? So going back to the Cambridge Science Park, so it all started, as I mentioned, in the 1970s. It, Again, slightly slow start, there was only 25 companies by the end of the 1970s. And a lot of those companies were people who wanted to share in the Cambridge atmosphere. They wanted to look good by being associated with Cambridge and Cambridge University. So we got some very large companies sending in subsidiaries. Some of the companies you might recognize like coherent you know coherent they make all the big laser devices you know for microchips and so they are big u.s laser specialists so they moved a small subsidiary here but really weren't doing fundamental r d they simply wanted to be associated with the university and in reality steal the best students for their company okay so early not so much research, more associated with being associated with Cambridge. Now, this is where the story, the plot of our story changes dramatically, absolutely dramatically. I'm not too sure how many on the call are familiar with the British Technology Group, okay? Okay, the British Technology Group is a, a government, Quango, government organization. It was actually formed in 1981, although its roots are much older. It was an amalgamation of a lot of research development companies, etc. But what they had was the primary task of translating new research ideas into commercial products, which meant they had right a first refusal of all publicly funded inventions. So you sitting in your university have a great idea. You patent it. However, the BTG had their first refusal to uh, develop that idea, and you couldn't argue. Fundamentally, this was a great, great idea because at least it meant that somebody was looking or had an overview of all the patents which were being given out by universities, okay? Which is why the BTG was set up. Uh, historically, it can, the BTG can be traced back to after or during the Second World War, 
when the British government was shocked to find that we, they had to pay royalties to American companies when they needed to buy penicillin. Penicillin, the antibiotic was obviously developed in the UK, was developed in the UK, but never painted in the UK. It was never painted in the UK. It was painted in America. So the UK government were pretty annoyed that they had to pay the Americans money every time they used one of their own inventions. So the BTG was set up to ensure that new inventions were painted correctly. Byproduct was, unfortunately, they had first refusal, which very severely limited the university's ability to exploit. Anyone who deals with governments is familiar with the idea of quangos and how they can sometimes be less than flexible. However, in 1985, that restriction was removed. In 1985, the role of the BTG was changed. And the universities were able to choose the route by which their research could be exploited. So the BTG no longer had first refusal of all publicly funded inventions. Um, however, it is interesting to note that once that had been removed from them, the BTG actually expanded very rapidly. So they also benefited from the removal of the restrict of the requirement. Okay, this right of first refusal. And in 1986, they registered 355 interventions. By 1990, they had registered 524. And if you go and look online, you will find that the BTG, which is now a private company, is doing very well indeed in the bio sector market. So, the very fact that these restrictions were, remo were removed benefited both the, at the time, the government organization and also the academics in the universities. So it was a win-win scenario. So if you get a chance, just look at BTG, which is now a private company, and you will see how well they're doing. So the chains were broken. This led to strong growth, especially in the Cambridge Science Park. Academics led the activity. They were now free to develop new ideas in these new startups in the Science Park. Okay, this led to a lot more investment. The Trinity Center was opened which provided meeting places, restaurants, conference rooms, which can be used by everyone. And the Cambridge Innovation Center was opened, which provide incubator space, sports facilities, et cetera. So we now had a support mechanism. More fundamentally, venture capitalists moved in, for example, 3i, okay? 3i opened offices in the science park. So you could just go along and talk to them. They had open days. You just went along and talked to them. Okay, brilliant. Okay, and things started to have positive feedback. For example, one major um, company, Cambridge Consultants, which was made up of ex-Cambridge academics, started to create their own spin-offs. So Cambridge consultants started producing their own companies. For example, my ex-wife's company, Lynx Printing, was actually started by Cambridge consultants. So they no longer required the university background for support. So although, for example, my ex-wife's company, they were academics from 
Cambridge University. They got their PhD in developing very advanced inkjet printers. They were able to use Cambridge consultants as a path from the academic into the commercial world. So we started seeing spin-offs. We started seeing the companies in the science park having their own offspring. And we started seeing the offsprings merging. For example, we saw QDOS, yes, which was a merger between University's Microelectronics Lab and Prelude Technology Investments and Cambridge Consultants. So we started seeing, we started to see this kind of positive feedback mechanism creating these new companies. We're seeing all the major elements in place now. We're seeing the infrastructure, we're seeing the funding, we're seeing the attraction, we're providing paths to the commercial environment. So the major elements are in place. And 1990s, it just kept growing. There were many, many new companies joining. So by the end of 1999, we had 64 companies on the Cambridge Science Park alone employing 4,000 people. Many new high-tech companies moved in and more fundamentally, new science parks opened. For example, the St. John's Innovation Center started. The Cambridge Business Park opened. Addenbrooke's Hospital started rebranding itself as the biomedical campus. And later we saw people like um, Apcam moving in. We saw, for example, now we see AstraZeneca moving in. Okay. Um, so we, but the Cambridge Science Park was now maturing. We were getting fewer, but larger, better funded companies on the Science Park. Okay. Um, so the actual, the Cambridge Science Park was changing its focus a bit, okay? Many of the new companies are on the stock market. However, the point of this slide is please look at my point four. The focus changed with technology. When I first started being involved with the science park, it was all internet and telecoms, my background. My background in telecom was working for British Telecom, uh, Philips Telecom. It was all internet companies, web spaces, and all that kind of computer related and networking related activities. That's all gone. It's all life sciences now. It's all about genes. It's all about pharma. So the park has changed its technology direction very, very rapidly. There are very few internet or telecoms companies on the park anymore. They are all related to life sciences. And we attracted a lot more venture capital companies onto the site. So by the end of 1999, there were over 1,200 technically or high-tech companies in Cambridge employing 35,000 people. And remember, Cambridge is only a small city. We're not like Oxford. We're not a big city. For those who have lived in Cambridge, we are a very small city. In the 2000s, we kept expanding. So the Cambridge Science Park merged, uh, had a joint venture with another college, Trinity Hall, so Trinity College, Trinity Hall, I won't go into the background, but they have a common theme background, Open Science Park A. But during this period, we became more socially aware. Before we had gyms, we had cafes, but at the beginning of the 2000s, we realized that wasn't enough. So they started introducing things like child nurseries, okay, big child nurseries, not you know, little nurseries with four or five kids. This nursery can take like 115 children, okay? And also they started expanding the innovation center 
and lots more new big companies moved in doing R&D, people like Philips, Citrix, big, big companies. And of course, our favorite, because they have the most amazing big building, is NAP Pharmaceuticals. They have an amazing building. So we see this big, big expansion. Okay. And so we can see here this merge. So everything is changing with time. Everything is changing with time. And bringing it more up to date in the 2010s, we started getting major, major building expansion. We got the new Bio Innovation Center. Remember, our focus has moved from internet and web into life sciences. So we had the Bio Innovation Center full of lab space for any startup life sciences, the Bradford Center, and large, more large farmers moved in. We talked about NAP Pharmaceuticals. We also have Takeda and Frontier. Those in pharma are very, very familiar with these two large, large organizations. Okay. Um, so the Bio Innovation Center is big. It's 40,000 square feet. And the Innovation Center and the research facility is another 60,000 square feet. So we're not talking about small buildings here. Okay. And also at the time, they started appointing their first uh, park director because they knew as we went into the 2020s, things were growing rapidly. But they needed again that coordinating body. So they appointed the first um, director, a lady called Jeanette Walker. And her job was to take the science park through its next 50 years. And through that, we saw again major, major expansion. Okay. Now, getting boring, so I'm going to talk about something slightly more interesting. Those who live in Cambridge know we have our own language. Unless you live here, you more likely have no idea what a bedder is, what a blue is, what the bumps are, what a plodge is, and why do we have the Mayballs in June? Okay, we have our own language associated with the university. The science parks have their own language. Here we have the um, spiel for the new Bradford Center. It is gobbledygook. It really is. Just take a minute and try and read it. Our aim is to attract ambitious, like-minded entrepreneurs from both Cambridge and around the world, co-locate them in scalable, state-of-the-art facilities, immerse them in vibrant, collaborative, and inclusive cultures, whilst connecting them to investors and other support organizations to help them grow. Not bad, is it? It's all one sentence as well. This is the language they speak. We used to call it gobbledygook many years ago. But going into the 2020s, it is expanding rapidly again at Science Park. A lot more friendly. Sustainability is vital. Stakeholder involvement is top priority now. No longer do we just grow without taking into account the rest of society or the other residences. We have very, very aggressive stakeholder management activity. The transport links are amazing. As you know, 60% of people in, well, 50% of people in Cambridge cycle to work. Okay. That's great, except in winter, it's damn cold to cycle, so you take buses. So they started working on how to make transport links more effective. If you go from employing a few thousand people to say a few tens of thousand people, how do you get people in? I live right next to Adam Brooks, the bio, camp, bio campus, and basically we have about 
50,000 people working there with about parking spaces for about three to 4,000. AstraZeneca ended up building their own multi-story car park to accommodate those who wish to drive in. So we started looking at a much more integrated and sustainable environment. And this is all led out from the 2017 review by Janet Walker. Uh, this is a quick slide indicating how the facilities have opened over the years. So in the 2010s, 39%, going back into 2000s, 31%, 1990s, 12%, and pre-1990, 17%. So as you see, it's not from, you know, it's not like a large exponential growth. It's a nice steady trend of growth in technology inside this area. Okay. So we talk about the science parks and the observations. Um, have a look at them. The science park took off because of Cambridge University. You can't avoid it. It would not have happened without the university. And in fact, you'll find most of the science parks around the UK or tech parks are linked to universities. provided freedom and support for academics to become entrepreneurs. Gone are the days in the 40s and 50s and 60s where the academics had to leave the university in order to exploit their technology. Most of the academics can live in both worlds now. They can live in the commercial world, safe in the knowledge that they are being looked after. Government intervention can hinder and support their success. The setting up of the um, Cambridge Science Park was done by the university. Initially, it was hindered by the government, but the government provided funding. Come back to that shortly. But they were able to release shackles, which allowed the entrepreneurship of the academics to flourish. You need a complete infrastructure. It's not technology on its own. You need coffee makers. You need sandwich makers. You need finance. You need everything, okay? You need car parks for those who can't be bothered to cycle, okay? You need um, swimming pools, you need nurseries, you need childcare facilities. Half, well, over half the staff are female with children and men with children. They need the children to stay somewhere where they're at work. You need the facilities to drop your children off to school. You need a mixture of organizations to provide sustainability. You need basic R&D. You need the ability to be flexible. Okay, you need things to be flexible. And one example here as a quick sideline is my car is actually serviced on Cambridge Research Park, Cambridge Research Park, uh, which is to the north of Cambridge. And the technicians there, I was talking to the technicians there, and they are talking to technicians who work in high academic and high technology companies. So my car mechanic is talking to technicians who work in these high-tech industry. And they realize the skills they're using to mend my cars are the basic skills required in high-tech industries. So they're not scared to move across. It's all well and good having very clever people, but at the end of the day, you do actually need people who can use their hands, people who have technical and technician capability. So we need a mixture of people. And Again, you need flexibility. You need to be able to adapt to changes in technology and changes in the economy. So not only was the change, for example, in the Cambridge Science Park from information to life sciences, that was not just a technology change, it was an economic change as well. The money moved from internet 
and networking into life sciences. Money is in pharma now. So you have to be flexible. And to be flexible, you must have a good selection of skill sets. The other observation comes from the other side. This allows modern universities to continue teaching and research as their primary missions. It's taken this stress away from them to be commercially viable. The universities can point and say, look, we have done this. We have made this money. And then look at the science parks. They, they, so it's removed a lot of the pressure from the pure academic staff in universities. So they can get on with what they're supposed to do, which is we teach and research. And secondly, they brought a link between the community and the university. University doesn't employ many people locally. A few cleaners, you know, a few people to look after the students, a few people in a cafeteria. However, the science park provides thousands and thousands of jobs. So the science parks provide that link between the R&D and the universities with the local community. As a quick observation, success attracts investment. Success attracts growth. Success attracts the best professionals and technicians. It attracts for large companies for prestige and opportunity. And it allows R&D to be a product, a profitable product, not just a way of learning any money from licenses and patents, but by implementation. But in order to succeed, we need the inbuilt flexibility to meet the changes in technology. You need to keep that professional and technician capability changing. That is what the university is for. Academics are not scared to commercially exploit their ideas. So, and they're aware of the opportunities. Funding investment is not fixed anymore. We have lots of venture, cap venture capital organizations on the campus. We're not relying on government funding so much. We're coming back to that. And the infrastructure is capable of supporting that change. And last but not least, in summary, the university provide, the science parks provide that portal between university and industry. They attract professional and skilled workers to a local area so that the overall demeanor of the area improves dramatically. And Science Park generate local demand and grow their economies directly in the parks and indirectly through business supporting the parks. Now, not wishing to finish on a low note, the big problem we have was in 2018, Cambridge was identified as Britain's most unequal city. We have the most, we have the richest people, and we are the poorest. We are still a rural city, basically meaning agriculture. So we have very low wages. So we now have the title of Britain's most unequal city. So there are downsides as well. Now, what I'd like to do now is turn my attention to Sri Lanka. Okay. As someone committed to working in Sri Lanka, okay, I am the first to admit you have Sri Lanka has some of the best universities. There are some very, very, very good universities and standalone research institutes. In fact, as you know better than I do, Sri Lanka actually has six universities in the Times Education World University Rankings. That's not bad. Six universities in the Times Higher Education World University Rankings. They are good. You have 17 government universities, UGCs, and six other government 
universities, and 25 institutes recognize the grant degrees. You are not short of universities. Okay, and some of them, especially the institutes recognize the grant degrees, are exceptional. Um, I have quite a lot of work with Sinec. Um, in Sinec, the Maritime, and the Colombo International, Colombo International Nautical Engineering College, and the Sri Lankan Institute of Information Technology. They are amazing companies. They're absolutely amazing universities. I expect most of you are more familiar with the University of Colombo and Moratorio and etc. But these are amazing universities. They are churning out some really good students for the country. Okay. However, I can only find one science or tech park which comes even close to my definition of a tech park. But the reason I'm giving you this talk now is not only to show my ignorance about Sri Lanka, but also for us to start thinking about future science parks. Sri Lanka is in at the moment proposed five big tech parks. One of the five is under construction at the moment, and we'll come on to that in a second. And I'm not forgetting the agro techno Agro Technology Park at Kolamatia, not least because they have the best arch of anywhere I know in a tech park. That is an amazing arch for those who have actually been to see it. Okay, so why do you only have one science park? Okay, and I think it all boils down to Sorry, it boils down to many reasons. And one of the key ones is here. R&D investment in 2006. Sri Lanka's percentage of GDP was less than 0.2%. I repeat, less than 0.2%. Compare that with Malaysia or India, where we are talking about 0.6%. Okay, they're still low compared to Europe. We were about 2.3%, but 0.2% is miserable. I do appreciate that during 2006, you were still in the troubles and there were still all the ongoing problems with um, uncivil rest, civil unrest. However, the picture never improves. So, the, as you can see from this graph, uh, your regional average, so we're talking about Thailand, India, Malaysia, et cetera, is way above Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka runs along quite happily, just under 0.2%, okay? Keeps under 0.2%. You know, we can put this down to, you know, lack of innovation culture in the country or risk adverse private sectors that do not see much benefit in local R&D ventures or the idea that overseas is better. I don't know. We're going to come back onto that. So is this actually important, though? Um, Sri Lanka's main exports are basically tea and spices and apparel and textiles clothing. So do we need R&D in order to maximize those industries? And the answer is maybe. Here I have a graph. Now, if you're not into economics and finance, this graph is going to be a bit annoying. OK, so what I'm showing here is um, differences. It's the first difference of logarithm for R&D and TFP. Now, um, TFP is total multi-factor production. So it's basically for those, it tells you about how much output you're getting for input. So it's a kind of how productive we are. So it's a ratio of output to input with a few other factors thrown in. But it, it's, it's what economists use to detect just how efficient 
a country is. Okay, as you can see here, we have a, if you follow the bottom line, which is the R&D growth, as you can see, when we have spikes in R&D money and growth, we also have spikes in the TFP. So they are related. Okay, this graph does not take into account EPUs or economic policy uncertainties, I do admit. So that's not in the graph, but it does affect the TFP line. But I think the general gist of this story is R&D does matter. So this data is from the Federal Reserve in Economic Data and from the World Development Fund. So it is actually real data. Well, this is okay. So let's have a quick look then. So going back into where this fits into funding. Okay, so if we look at Sri Lanka, your sources of R&D funding, 56% comes from the government. You remember we were talking about risk adverse private sector? Only 41% comes from business and 3% from overseas. That is pitifully low, 3%. If you think, for example, China as a developing country, the businesses contribute 70% of the R&D funding. I repeat, 70% businesses are 70%. In the UK, as a more developed country, it's 54%. Okay. 20% is in the UK is government and 20% is overseas. We are still very, very heavily dependent on funding overseas. Sorry, we're very on government funding in Sri Lanka. Okay. And also you notice that your R&D expenditure is in agriculture, not engineering or technology, which makes sense. Okay, as spices and spices and teas, your main export, and one of your crit one of our critical necessities is to become self-sufficient in food. But if you are going to develop a science park as a techno park, 20% is a very, very low ratio. Again, these figures come actually from the research economist. Um, so it's uh, Sri Lanka Central Bank. Okay. So talking about government involvement. Okay. Stanford Research Park, which was the first research park, was an, an, was an agreement between the city of Palo Alto and Stanford University. So that required government sponsorship. So the government was directly involved. In Cambridge, Cambridge Science Park was set up because the government threatened their funding. Positive spin, UK government initiative. Okay. The closest I can find to such initiative in Sri Lanka is the, and one of the example I'm going to use is the nano National Nanotechnology Initiative, which has some pretty clear goals, really quite well-defined goals. Very clear objective, promote nanotechnology, developing nanotechnology-based industries in Sri Lanka, lovely objectives. How are they going to do it? By attracting um, expertise, both locally and overseas. And the result will be Increase the competitiveness of local industries through local R&D. Add value to national resources slated for exports. And develop local skill-based centers. So this is perfect. This initiative ticks the boxes what I would expect for a government or any kind of plan. Okay. It's stalled. It stalled. Main reason, lack of funding. That is what is stated. However, 
going back to one of the great observations in life is for those who work in many different companies, you begin to realize things don't move unless you have a champion. You need somebody who is going to go out on a limb, somebody who is going to champion your idea. And here into our story comes Professor Ravi Silva, CBE Fellow of the Royal Society of Engineering, uh, a Director of Advanced Technology Institute, ATI, Head of Nanoelectronic Centers in the UK. He's Professor of a Surrey University, in Surrey University. His, he greatly forced or champions this whole idea. And this resulted in um, the setting up of Slintech. I'll come back to Slintech in a minute. I have missed out Nanco. So Nanco was set up in 2007 as a public private partnership, as a holding company for this initiative. Okay, so the funding was from the government side was via the NSF and the Ministry of Science and Technology. Okay, and there was funding from inter uh, business as well. So it was a public private partnership. Of a deliverable. And this is where Slintech come in. So Slintech, as most of you are aware, is the um, is the Sri Lankan Institute of Nanotechnology, Slintech. Okay, and this was established through Nanco. And it was actually had money. Money. It had 450 lakh or 450 million, no, 450,000 lakh, 450 million uh, rupees. And they managed to get 50% through the National Science Foundation, SFF, and through the University Ministry of Science and Technology. However, five private sector partners all contributed in uh, 40 million rupees as well, giving them a 10% stake. So here we see companies which for our Sri Lankan brethren are quite familiar with. So we have here, um, so here we have Brandix and Mass Holdings, okay, which are, are obviously here because of the textile. They are big, organizations associated with apparel textiles. We have Lodestar, which is a 60% Belgian company producing tires. And we have Haley's, which is a pretty old company with many diverse activities, okay? They are important because each of those industries requires or can utilize nanotechnologies. So they're brought on partners who can benefit from this institute, okay? In 2008, Slintech became a private company. Very quickly, going through here, its history, um, it became, took over the um, Nanco, as Nanco was originally set up for the nanotechnology part in Homagama. But the only real institute which seems to have formed there was Slintech. So they got subconsumed backwards. In order to get this whole thing off the ground and working, in 2009, they started formal research work at the Mass Holdings buildings. Now, Mass Holdings and their chairman, um, their chairman, Mahesh Amalian, plays a major part in moving this whole project forward again. Okay, so 
it's not just Ravi, it's internal Sri Lankan people as well. So in 2010, Nanko merged into Slinko, so the National Park became merged into the Institute. And in 2012, they, managed, they started the first nano center. Remember what I said in the center parks? It's slow burn start, but once you start going, things happen rapidly. So by 2013, they had the first nanotechnology center opened and they got their first sixth private sector partner, Lanken. Okay, so um, we're now seeing things moving. And in 2021, they opened their second center of excellence. All well and good. We talked infrastructure. Now talking about what they do. So they really have two commercial agreements, which are big. The first one is with Narajuna, which for those who aren't in agriculture may, may not recognize, but they are an enormous fertilizer company, absolutely enormous in India. And Haley's are funding it through the agricultural division. So they're using nanotechnology so that they can add particles into the fertilizer so that the fertilizer deteriorates a lot slower. I mean, they said, so it re reduces microbial degradation. Brilliant. Somebody like Sri Lanka, and we all are familiar with the problems with fertilizer in Sri Lanka. And the other one is associated with titanium dioxide. Now, Many of you, if you are not in this work industry, uh, may not be familiar with titanium dioxide. It is a critical element in, as a pigment in coloration. It is the most common way of producing white. Titanium dioxide. Now you've mentioned it, you'll know it forever. So if you want white clothes, if you want white paint, or if you want to turn something white before adding coloring or to make it lighter, paints lighter, dyes lighter, you need titanium dioxide. There is a lot of titanium dioxide in the sands in um, Sri Lanka. Ilmenite mineral sand reserves are abundant in Sri Lanka. They're not exploited. I think you export them, but there's, if I never heard of anyone actually taking the ilmenite and producing titanium oxide. Major, major money spinner, if you can get it. 80% of all dyes require and pigments require titanium dioxide. Don't underestimate it. 2018, they had joint venture with the LOLC group and Slintech to form Salon Graphic Technologies to exploit the graphing products. So at least we're getting companies who can take ideas and get them into the commercial world. And through here, they started having many more private sector clients. But these are clients, these aren't companies. So this is bringing work into the Institute. And the one obviously, which is close to my heart is um, British Cosmetics. Okay, British Cosmetics. They, nanotechnologies are important in cosmetics. If you want that foundation to stay in place, and not melt, you need nanotechnologies. Similarly with Dino Wash, for those who dye their own clothes or you need um, stabilized dyes. Nanotechnology is used to stabilize dyes um, in biomass pigments, okay? So it is, important. What they're doing is fundamentally important to the country. Um, going back to my original slide on Slintech, one of their aims was to attract 
expertise. And they've done that in what is called the Overseas Mind Group. Here we have Professor Gravi Silvi again. We have uh, Jehan Amagatunga, okay, from Cambridge University. We have uh, Fasana de Silva from Queen's University. And we have Rukra Singer, who is IBM fellow, who I think is local. So they have fulfilled that by going out and reaching out to predominantly expat expertise and channeling it to produce a organization which can benefit the country. And the facilities they now have is they have two startup programs. They have the accelerator, which allows you to expand on existing projects, not projects. I'm not sure what happened there. Spell check are not working. And also they have a developing incubator space, about 20,000 square feet of incubator space. Okay. It's not like the science park where we've introduced 60,000 this year, but 20,000 is a good start. So they can help existing projects and they can support new projects. They have a fairly, well, they do have a good R&D, so they can outsource their R&D. They have good bio lab facilities. They have modular labs. They have what we're looking for, for starting new industries, okay? But, okay, so that is Slintex. So let's go back to the Nano Science Park for a second, okay? So, We've been talking about Slintech, which seems to be the major organization on the park, and now actually, I believe, runs the park. So it did actually start operation in 2008. It has 48 lovely landscape acres in Romagama. It is expected to generate 1,500 jobs, and again, has some very, very nice objectives, okay? To become world leader, enhance, most of the industrial products, such as rubber products, apparels, and energy. So they are again focused on what nanotechnology would benefit existing industries. Okay. And the second objective is develop new products and create intellectual products that can be exploited whilst the park will house the manufacturing plants for local and foreign inward investors. So we can get these ideas into the manufacturing arena. So not only do these clients come in or we do the research and we get a product, but we can take it the next step into manufacturing. Okay. So is Lintech and the Nano Science Park a science park? Or is it just a glorified institute on steroids? It has a good selection of shared facilities. It has a wide range of innovation tools and facilities. It has funding partners in place. It has links to internal and external Sri Lankan markets. It's exploited expat skills, but it is focused in exploiting single technology. Okay, it was focused, let me go back to that one because it's important. It's focused on exploiting single technology. Now, as many of you are aware who follow Sri Lanka, in 2014, there was, there was an initiative for commercialization of inventions. In 2014 budget, great fanfare, a lot of announcements about initiatives for commercialization of inventions. And in order to fulfill this, they formed the Technology Park Development Company. And these were to provide basically science parks, technology park environments. And five parks were proposed, Gaul, Kurunagagala, Kandy, Noelia, Abarana, 
five were proposed. This is going back to 2014. Jumping forward to 2022, here we have February 2022. The plaque is unveiled in the first one in Gore. So we've got the plaque up for the first one. So the objectives are good. Attracting foreign investments, encouraging new companies, promoting exports, creating jobs. So we have the right for techno parks and science parks. We've got the first one on its way, expected to be completed next year, which seems highly ambitious, but the other four haven't started yet. So looking at the science parks as the UK and in particular Cambridge as a model, and looking at the Slintech as a model of quite an industrialized research institute, what do we see in common? We see governments have a key role to play in both. Both needed a champion to get things moving. They did not move on their own. They needed somebody to push them. They have a lot of the same elements in place. They have capital funding, they have innovation, they have infrastructure, they have marketing. They are both attracting professionals, technicians, administrators. However, this is where they diverse. A science park is broad. It does fundamental research as a product, not just as a academic exercise. And it supports established companies into new technologies. Okay, so the question I am left with or leave with you is, are the science parks or techno parks the right way for Sri Lanka to move forward? Or do you think we should be putting more money into these nano institute kind of industrial model? And with that, I'll hand you back to Rowan. So Rowan, are you still here? Yes, I'm very much here. <laughs> and and you haven't fallen asleep. You have not fallen no. asleep. That is good. I was uh, following every word of it. And in addition, doing some of my research into some of you said on the internet as well. So thank you so much, John. And uh, I personally uh, enjoyed it. And um, the, the amazing knowledge you have about Sri Lanka it, it surpasses mine. Uh, I didn't know any of those, maybe because I'm in a different sector. But, yes, um, but you are in life sciences, Rowan. You are in life sciences. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and so is the wife, yes? <laughs> yes, but not, not, not the technology with the nano, uh, nanotech institute, etc. It's a little bit beyond our uh, life sciences. But probably I would start a, a question. So as you correctly said that Cambridge has moved from technology into life sciences, and Sri Lanka is still in the technology phase. Uh, at the same time, we are really going through or went through a phase of um, um, uh, lack of pharmaceutical products in Sri Lanka. And do you know of any attempt to manufacture at least some pharmaceutical products in any of these technology parks? Only not in these science parks, no. I cannot find many companies who are committed to the science parks. When I talk to people, they want to see it before they invest. So, for example, when we look at the uh, Slintech, these are the old names. So everyone in Sri Lanka knows these people. They are the big, rich companies, and they can see where their profit is. So they know where then return on investment is going to be. In pharmaceuticals, that's not so clear. In order to make money in pharmaceuticals, you need a much bigger market. You need a lot of expertise. So pharmaceutical 
I am not seeing much activity here at all. Which is quite ironic if you imagine that places like Peridinia University were set up. One of their major activities was uh, tropical medicine, research into tropical medicine. Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, we got a question from Sati first. Sati Arinagam. Thank you. Oh. Let me just uh, see whether I can get my camera. Otherwise, I'll just fire away the question. Uh, thank you very much, John, for the enlightening talk. Uh, learned a bit about um, science parks today. I got a couple of questions, but I'll start with one and stop there for you to cover other people's questions. And then if time permits, I'll come back to the other ones. Uh, the first one is slightly, or well, rather it is more political, uh, but given the reality of circumstances, I'm posing that question to you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you fine. Thank you, Soki, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, with the prevailing regional hegemony, uh, and the advancement of India in uh, scientific areas, one would expect external nanotechnology developers to be less favorable to form partnership with Sri Lanka. Do you agree? Or am I wrong in making that assumption? Ah, this is at the heart of my talk. Thank you for raising this. Sri Lanka has a great advantage of having an exceptionally high um, literacy rate science level, okay? Yes. So when you focus, you are amazing. You think about how in the past they took over things like the tea industry, took over the textile industry, yes? We think of these as boring activities nowadays, yeah? That, you know, tea is boring. If you go back to, for example, when James Taylor was developing the initial tea industry in Sri Lanka, yes? You know, he was at the cutting edge of technology. Who would have thought that he could have impacted the Indian or um, India or, God, what the other country was now, tea, markets, Kenyan tea markets. They did. Yes, because they had a better product. I see that with nanotechnology. With the focus on what makes money, allows external people to understand you can make money here. And whoever gets in first makes the money. Very few nanotechnology companies can equal what Slintech is up to now, outside the developed world. India, no, it's not where India is at the moment. It's like in pharmaceuticals. India is very much focused on exploiting the developing country's weakness, which is in uh, information skill sets. We don't have enough people, technical people, to fulfill our needs. So no, I do not see India as a threat to your nanotechnology at all. Thank you. Sorry, does that answer your question? It does, yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, shall I we move, uh, Sati, uh, there is Aja, and then shall we come back to you for your second question? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, thank you, Aja, your turn. Um, John, thank you very much. I enjoyed that lecture very much. Uh, it was very enlightening. Uh, it was heartening to, um, to hear uh, the scientific uh, uh, sort of developments that uh, we were not aware of. Um, uh, with, uh, and you rightly said that we have a very educated public, uh, but uh, that doesn't um, sort of reflect on the policy makers. The, the policy makers that is the government uh, in Sri Lanka seems to be uh, so uneducated and therefore the, the 
policies they have made, certainly in the last um, few years, have been uh, so, um, what shall I call it, ignorant of, of the current science. So that is one of the issues that Sri Lanka faces where government needs to get involved. Um, do you think that is acting as a deterrent to development in Sri Lanka? I would give come at that pro at that from another angle. Okay, I would come at that from another angle. Um, for myself as an engineer, and from Ruan as a medical practitioner, it's our job to tell the government what we need. Okay, um, governments aren't in isolation. Okay. Governments don't work in isolation. So it's our job to tell the government what we need. That's one of the things I'm doing here, trying to raise awareness. Okay. And the second aspect of government policy is the, um, the second aspect of government policy, as far as I am concerned, is that limited funds need to be focused. So obviously I, I've known Rowan, I've known Sri Lanka for about eight years now, I think. Yeah, we've known each other for quite a while now. Okay, and that's my involvement. And I'm seeing a lot of money, not necessarily wasted on things like infrastructure projects for which you get minimal return. For example, I'm looking out now onto the port for my office for my study. Okay, so I can see the new Chinese island, for example. Okay. Governments are allowed to do that because we allow them to do it. Okay. Okay, we've had the unrest earlier in the year. Okay, not the way to do it. The way to do it is to ensure for people like you, me, Rowan, get our views over. Okay. Governments need to know what is successful. And the other thing governments need to know is they've got to learn to trust their people. One problem I find in Sri Lanka is the government does not trust the people. A good example would be investment. My own background is once I got my PhD, I worked with Bell Lab and I worked in a small country called Trinidad and Tobago in the West Indies. And Rowan often hears this story. So sorry, Rowan, you're going to hear it again. When I first moved out there in 1984, 1985, the government did not trust the people. I could only take out something like 5,000 US dollars when I left the country. I couldn't get a work visa easily. I had to get sponsorship from, I don't know, established countries, you know. I could not draw upon local banks for investment, okay? There was no incentive for me as a professional person to go and work there, okay? I find that a little similar to Sri Lanka, yes? I am very limited, the money I can take overseas, I can leave the country with. It's very difficult for me to get access to local funds, even if there were local funds. The government dominates research development because, you know, if it, exporters come in, you've got loads and loads of initiatives to bring um, exporters in to develop. But whilst you still have restrictions, <laughs> you know, they're not going to come. Yes. So answering your question is the biggest thing the government could do is trust the people. Yeah. If you and I are only allowed to take 5,000 US dollars out of the country each year, we'll all take out 5,000 US dollars every year. Okay. If I know I can take out as much money as I want next year, I won't take out that 5,000 US dollars this year. Just as an example, the government has got to learn to trust the people. 
Sorry, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, partially. Um, the, 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 uh, the word trusty does not exist between the people and the government at the moment, unfortunately. Anyway, that's another discussion. We'll uh, yes. go on to another question, I think. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, trust is at the bottom of everything in business. And if you don't have trust, it's hard to do business. Yes. Let's, let's pick that up a little bit later, perhaps. Uh, but let's give it to Daika. Daika with Anna. Hello, John. Uh, hello. Thank you for the uh, hello. Uh, thank you for the uh, excellent talk. Uh, uh, there are a few uh, questions and uh, just an observation as well. And uh, I'd also like your opinion about uh, your teaching of English to these uh, professionals, because currently I'm uh, focused on a much younger age group. Actually, two boys in my old school, Royal College whom I'm teaching online and the difficulties that I face uh, because they are from uh, modern lingual sort of singly speaking families. Uh, they have got scholarships to come to the Columbus school and they're in the hostel and uh, they are sort of, uh, well, not as good as, uh, their English is not as good as the, the Columbus boys and uh, it's affecting them psychologically as well. So I have, with my limited uh, teaching ability, I have sort of got them up to a certain standard. I'll tell you a little bit about it, but uh, my questions are these. Uh, well, one is, one is an observation. It's uh, my sister who is actually a electronics uh, telecommunications engineer in Australia. She, uh, she, I think is probably what you describe as a, academic who got frustrated with working in the university and went out and formed a, a company, which is called, uh, it's called, uh, let me see, the name slips me in my mind. Uh, and uh, it, it started, a, it, it opened a branch this year in the Cambridge, uh, you know, Technology Park. And she's thinking of uh, opening a, another branch in, uh, in uh, Sri Lanka as well, I'm not certain where, but she's a, a graduate from uh, the Moratua University. Uh, the other question that I have is uh, about uh, an invention of my own, which one would know about because it happened in Aldehay Hospital. You see, uh, where I come from is uh, I was an ENT surgeon subsequently changed my specialty to a, a sort of a, a subspecialty audio vestibular medicine, which deals with hearing and balance disorders. And in the uh, latter part of my career, I developed a computer algorithm, actually a, a app which uh, could be used instead of the conventional uh, audio meter. Basically, it's a computer game and it was focused on children. So the child would come and play a computer game. And uh, as a, you know, when you play a game, you get a score in the end. The score would be the audiogram. Now, the difficulty that I'm facing is this was in Alder Hay, and uh, the Alder Hay Hospital terminated my contract before the product was sort of completed and patented. So unfortunately, they lost their holding on it. But okay, uh, a, a company which uh, a startup company which now owns the product uh, actually holds the the patent. The difficulty that I have is I'm no longer working, and Alderhe is refusing to to uh, sort of do a pilot study to clinically validate the product. Now there's another hospital, Great Roman Street Hospital, who's quite willing to do that. But uh, you see, the Alder is holding on to it a bit like uh, like uh, a dog in the manger, and uh, so mm. it's stuck in that place. And I I was thinking of Sri Lanka because I know that Moroto University has a medical faculty now, and the Kalania University has an audiology uh, department. 
and this is where I pose the question. I mean, does it matter whether it is uh, a university that undertakes and owns the product or would it have to be some sort of science park like uh, establishment? Okay, um, I've got three questions there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so, uh, the first one about teaching. Yeah. Okay. I don't actually teach English. I see. Right. To say to teach English has a very off meaning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I was to tell, for example, Rowan as a traditional Sri Lankan that I teach English, he automatically thinks grammar. He mm. automatically, yes, I teach communication skills. I see. Mm -hmm. Because the big problem I have in Sri Lanka, okay, and I'll come back to your two sons in a moment, is I teach at the University of Vocational Technology. And I'm not sure, have you heard of this university? No. Have you heard? Okay. okay. It's, okay, it's down in Motoria, okay? And a lot of the background students there are very poor. We're not talking like students who go to University of Colombo. They're poor, okay? Half of them can't even afford a laptop. A lot of my classes are on um, uh, smartphones. Yes. John, uh, just just one word from me. I think yeah. that uh, that uh, university is known to us, most of us, as the German Technology Institute in Katumadda, German Tech. Oh, thank you. That's, yeah. that's why people don't recognize it. I see. Oh, I'm mostly sure. Yes, I should have said that. I, my experience in Sri Lanka only goes back about five to eight years. So, yeah. So it was one of those universities which got converted. Now, it gives even more emphasis to the fact that they are poor. So I am not teaching, I do not sell teaching English. What I have sold to the university, I am selling them confidence. Okay. I'm selling confidence. For the last, so these are undergrads. So for the last 10, 12 years, they have been taught English from a very, very grammatical background. So their grammar is good. Mm -hmm. Their vocabulary is not bad. What they don't have is that confidence to speak, to commit to writing, and to communicate. So what I teach is confidence. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think uh, uh, that is what I have been focusing as well, because I felt that teaching of grammar should be left to their sort of the English uh, teachers, although yes. they have not, you know, progressed very much there. So I correct their grammar, but mainly I focus on them reading to me aloud. Yes. Actually, uh, I have written, uh, I mean, I, I, I write uh, stage plays. So I've given them little scripts to read as actors so that they can act their parts. Hence, uh, yes, beyond yes. the uh, skill to sort of speak with correct intonation and, uh, you know, as if they were really, you know, uh, yes. to that part. Yes. Now, be careful because um, reading is what we call a receptive skill. Sure. We need confidence in the productive skills, which are yeah. speaking and writing. So I am quite a bit of a shock to the local students. I speak to every student in my class, every lecture. So, for example, I've just come off a lecture at, um, for the part time workers. Mm -hmm. And there were about 40, 45 people in that class. Right. I spoke to every one of them three or four sentences. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. When I first started, none of them would volunteer to speak. Mm -hmm. Of course, we've got the two or three natural speakers like you always do. 
Mm. But most were very, very timid. They didn't have the confidence to speak. But by talking to everyone, so this is the end of their first semester, they are Mm. now confident to speak. So if I say to them, "Um, good evening, how are you? They know how to respond. They know to say, I am fine, thank you. How are you? Mm. Okay. They know I am fantastic. Thank you. How are you? I'm having a good day. Thank you. How are you? Mm. So once they get those um, triggers, they have confidence to speak. It releases that grammar knowledge later. Yeah. It's, yeah. For example, I was teaching them how to tell the time. Mm-hmm. You, as a natural English speaker, don't tell the time the same way as you were taught at school. Mm. Yes? You never tell an exact time in English, do you? No. You always say it's all—it's right, about 20 to 10. Mm. Yes? At school, you are told it, it is 9.43 a.m., like a clock. Mm. And that marks them out as different. So I teach them the confidence to use natural language. I teach them about body language. I teach mm. them how to dress. I teach them how to use knife and fork. I Mm. teach them how to recognize emotional intelligence and things like that. Yes. So I don't teach grammar (laughs) unless it's very, very, very advanced grammar for, you know, just to keep the clever ones on board. However, I also teach at the University of Moratura. Mm -hmm. Am I pronouncing it right, Moratura? Yeah, Moratura. Yeah, that's right. And those are a different class of student. Mm. Yes. They can speak pretty good English. Mm. Yes. Their English is pretty good. So I can focus on the higher level skills, such as how to make good presentations. Mm. Okay. How to make a good presentation. How to maximize things like your body language. So Mm. I can teach them grammar, but subliminally, Mm. not in your face. Mm. Okay, so I don't get them to repeat specific grammar. They learn from Mm. the way I'm teaching the other subjects, for example, how to make presentation, how grammar works. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's the first point. The second one you talked about is startups. Okay. Mm. Yes, there are loads in Cambridge. Okay, you can fix your ideas to Mm. lots of companies there. They are waiting. Now, just be a little bit careful when you're just talking about like web services, things like that. Not so interested. Okay. London is the place of places like web services. We are much more interested in ideas. Mm. Okay. Manufacturing new ideas. So, but there are lots. So just go into any of the directories in Cambridge. Just to look in Cambridge investors. There's a lot. And you can just pitch the idea to them. And you'll find money. Okay, it's a lot of them. So do not, if she wants to start here, your sister wants to start here, and she has a track record in Australia. Okay. And... She, has, she has, I mean, I, I, I just mentioned that uh, uh, yeah. as a point. I mean, she's, she's well into, uh, yes. yes. I mean, she, she has won awards. And if you look her name up, there are many patterns in her name, wireless technology. I just yes. mentioned it because uh, I was a bit surprised when she mentioned just recently that she's investing, uh, that a company is going to invest in Sri Lanka. And I just well, want this to... Is, yeah, uh, this is what we want. This is yeah. what we want. But yeah. I would go with an institute. Mm. I okay? see. Now, Sri Lanka relies heavily on patents and licenses. You mm-hmm. are a, as I said before, you are a very... Um, legitimate country it's not like china where people steal your patents <laughs> okay yeah. yes you are safe mm. but i would definitely find an institute a university to start with and work with them right yes yeah that's uh, the idea that, that, it is. Okay. that is for my audio meter that is yeah uh, no i'm coming back to that in a minute <laughs> that's your third question right okay. with respect to the audio meter which we're now talking about web apps mm. okay again my Sri Lankan, um, blah, blah, blah. my Sri Lankan, my Sri Lankan connections click in here as well. Mm-hmm. So, for example, I'm working with, well, not working with, but I'm working 
through other people with a guy called um, uh, Pasca, who works at St. George's. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he's developing an app or has developed an app which determines uh, childbirth mortality. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the UK, we have a very mixed we have a very mixed racial background. And okay, I'm test, test walking on racist words here, so I have to be careful. Mm -hmm. Different ethnic groups have different requirements during birth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to talk about this publicly in the UK. Very right. difficult. Okay. And in fact, the NICE rejected a previous attempt at birthing algorithms. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, working along with Batsky in St. George's and my, another friend in Bart's, we have got clinical trials running and we have got government funding for it. So if you follow, I'm not sure if it's publicly announced yet, but we're getting a few million. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, this is being developed by a group in St. George's. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is being developed by a group in St. George's. Now, any software which goes commercial yeah. is an extra 90% activity. Writing the software, getting it working is 10%. Getting it such that it's commercially viable and you're not going to get sued. So, for example, the mother of the child who missed the hearing test fails mm. his lawsuit. Okay, mm. so that 90% is critical. So, Basky is running clinical trials funded by the government, which we got via the committee, the Health and Science Committee. So, we pesked tested the science and health committee to get funding okay mm -hmm. so they got local funding through nice so they got little money to write their program and their program runs and they're running as a clinical trials actually in st george's but that's not good enough it has to be run in the other hospitals yeah okay that's right. the numbers so are important. you've got it so yeah. they got funding from so they pestered the committee on who on the health and safety committee it used to be run by Jeremy Hunt, who, as you now know, has taken over as chancellor. Yes, but we yeah. pestered Jeremy Hunt to give us money. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he we got funding that way. Okay, mm -hmm. and but the point I was going to make, which is relevant to what you're talking about, is so it's a app which doctors can use so that they can so we can assess um, ladies in during pregnancy we check their history we can feed in all the biometric signs we can look at their ethnicity and it allows women to make choices about their own birthing procedures mm which don't expose doctors to racism, which don't expect the um, um, gynecologists and uh, gynecologists and oh, I've forgotten the other ones now, to lawsuits. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So um, now they don't have the whereabouts to market is commercially mm -hmm. so what we have done is we found out we have engaged an external software company mm -hmm. which is focused on taking apps into the marketplace mm -hmm. and a lot of the money which we have got from the government is actually being used to commercialize the product. So the product's fine, the product works. We're going through clinical trials in other universities, in other hospitals now, but we are relying, we're not 
commercializing it ourselves. We're giving it to a third party company to commercialize. Mm. Okay, I can give you more details about that through Rowan or, you know, my number, I can talk about it. But yes, so I am associated with some quite serious app um, delivery inside the NHS. Sorry, does that answer your three questions? Uh, it does. Uh, my sister, of course. I'm not like you raised, not like you raised more questions than I've answered. Sure, sure. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, the, my sister, of course, will, will find her own way because she's well tuned into uh, managing her own affairs. And the yes. company is, uh, ext I mean, it's, it's a, it's a well-reputed uh, company, although it slips my mind what the name is. It'll come to me later. Uh, with regards to uh, the teaching, yes, uh, I, I, I appreciate what you said. I mean, I'll, I'll carry that uh, information on to teaching my two st uh, teenage uh, students. Uh, regarding my own uh, invention, yeah. uh, I'd really appreciate, John, if I could contact you through Ruan, because what I'm frustrated is the fact that there's these two hospitals which should actually be doing the clinical trials are at loggerheads with with each other and for many, many months now the whole project has got stalled. So hence the reason why I'm trying thinking yeah. of, you know, taking it to a completely mm. outside UK and getting the clinical trial out of the way. Uh, so mm. so I, I'll need a little bit so of... I would be very tempted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I One of my biggest hopes is that we can get more of this expat expertise back in the country. I work all over the world. Everywhere mm -hmm. I go, I meet really, really professional, you know, really highly skilled people like Rowan, yes, who have left the country, mm -hmm. yes? <laughs> we need this expertise. We need this knowledge here, mm. yes? Um, I, it's, you know, didn't mean to pick on you there, Rowan, so about that. But, you know, when I was working at Rolls Royce, you know, my senior engineer was Sri Lankan. I'm working mm. at, with Barclays Bank. My senior trader, okay, in charge of overseas currency conversions, he's Sri Lankan. Mm. Yeah. They should be, in, you know, I would say, obviously, it's their choice. Yes. But having somebody of that skill set back in a country. Yes, means you don't have to rely so much on government, the way governments work. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you can put the expertise back into the private sector, you can start running rings about, you mm -hmm. know, you can start controlling your own lives. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, the patent yeah. actually doesn't belong to me, although I have uh, uh, equity in it. Uh, but I'd mm -hmm. like to... Uh, email you perhaps a little bit of detail and then I would like your advice if uh, you could give it to me. Sure, of course, no problem. It's not my of expertise, but yeah. I talk a lot to people, so yes. yes. And yeah. okay, uh, I, just, I just remembered my sister's company. It's called Ordinate. Ordinate, okay. Australia, Sydney. Okay, yes. Uh, okay, no, I've not, unfortunately, I've not heard of it, but as I say, we have over 1,300 tech companies now in Cambridge. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of them. So it yeah. started in Cambridge uh, quite uh, recently, this year, in fact. <laughs> okay, shall we move on to the next question? Okay. Uh, so, uh, John, the next question is from uh, Dr. Kavan Ratnatunga. Kavan, um, he's, uh, he's an astrophysicist, and he worked uh, in America for years, and he worked for NASA as well. And then in his retirement, he came back to Sri Lanka and now residing back. So that's his background, just uh, so that you know um, to answer when answering the question. Come on, would you? I just wanted to find out if you knew about, it's not, a, not at the scale of science parks, but two attempts to have science uh, learning institutes in Sri Lanka. The first was the Institute for Fundamental Studies in Kandy, uh, which was started by J.R. Jawadana in 1978. And the second was the Arthur C. Clarke Institute, which is in Moratua, 
which was started by Arthur C. Clarke, and he invested and gave money for the buildings and everything else. Both, I think, failed because they ended up as government institutions <laughs> where there was no motivation to do research because their salary would anyway be paid. Yes. Uh, when I came back from US, I had lots of uh, research interests and capabilities that I could give either of those institutions, but neither was interested basically because they didn't, they thought if I came and helped them, they would have had to do more work for the same salary. So they just didn't continue. They are interesting institutions to study if you want to understand the mentality in Sri Lanka, which fails some of these institutions. I did go and see the Nanotechnology Institute there. I think they have produced a few things, but one of them, what they made, they immediately sold to India without actually uh, exploiting. exploiting it here. And they do have the right to use it here, but they, most of it was just a direct sale. Uh, so I think, uh, and actually, I think what is happening today is that the current environment in the country is not conducive for people to remain. Uh, people are just running away from the economy, which is a, in crisis. So I'm not sure whether any of these science parks at the moment, they will talk about things. And all they will ask for when they, somebody offers to fund money is how much of a commission they will get, which is what the politician is only interested in. Yes. So maybe we are a basket case. I'm sorry yeah, to nope. be there. <laughs> nope, 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 nope. Absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not there. So taking each of your points in turn again, um, I know the Institute of Fundamental Studies, yes, because it's one of the... Um, one of the types of university here. I can't remember which one because I've, I've now run out of computers. Okay. Um, I've also noticed, Ron, I forgot the tick the share sound box. Hence, you didn't hear about the taxi drivers on my, this, on my presentation. You would have heard about taxi drivers. The first taxi systems were in Cambridge. Uh, I just noticed that. But going back to the issue about private universities, I am in the middle of this at the moment. So for example, the Institute of Information Technology, I can't remember its exact name, is being threatened at the moment with being made public. They have a long history of being taken over by the government, then being dropped by the government because they will not fund research, then going private. So I am familiar with this whole idea of limitations of being a UGC university in this country. So point one, I'm familiar with the history, unfortunately. So have do you know the Institute of Information Technology? Have you heard of the yes, Institute? Slip, slip, yeah. Slip. yeah. Yeah. So they in slick or something i can't remember now they are in continual battles with the government about becoming a ucg ugc university and being private okay now the second point which you're talking about is my next fight so as rowan is aware i am initially involved with communication skills because it is an easy course to sell. It's a very, very easy course to sell. But that's not my final objective here. My final objective here is over the next couple of years is to introduce um, modern IT technology courses. The IT taught here is what I tend to call late 20th century technology, IT technology. And 
the universities I'm talking to here, I've actually found two who are willing to move forward with me. But, but exactly the same reason as you're talking about is because most of the big UGC universities have fixed funding, they have fixed pay scales, they don't want more work, I believe. Okay. So I am focused on predominantly the private universities in this country, not because they're better or worse, but because they are more flexible. Okay. So I, the, the issues you are talking about, I am aware of and, and in good traditional project management fashion, I work around them. I don't hit my head against the wall. I find an alternative. And at the moment, I am slowly but slowly moving forward. Okay, slowly but surely moving forward. So, sorry, does that answer your questions, uh, Carbon? Yes. yes, thank good. you. But um, the more, uh, do you think, see, see whether there will be a future for the five parks that you talked and Gaul was sort of supposed to be opened in February of this year? Do you think they are almost dead or do you think they will ever materialize? I think they will materialize eventually. You do need science parks, but you need to get people like the really rich, not rich, but powerful ones like University of Colombo or Peronia. You need them involved, front and center. Okay. Now, in the meantime, I believe the government should be more focused on these institute model, like the Nanotechnology Institute, the Information Technology Institute. It's much easier to control these. Okay. Um, I can't see the science park kicking in or being really profitable for many years yet. Sri Lanka has a problem today. Their problems need to be solved today. You have to exploit the existing facilities and resources to solve the problems today. Okay, uh, that is my personal opinion. And that's what I hopefully my talk was about. So people start thinking about how, you know, what is the future of new technologies, new research in Sri Lanka? Because obviously the universities are not really providing that commercial benefit to the country. They are sucking your money like nobody's business. But are they providing a return in the R&D sector? That's the question I'm asking. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And uh, probably uh, we'll go back to Sati, who had another question. Sati, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruan. And, uh... I think I could start with a lighter note, perhaps. John, you I hope so. <laughs> you, you, you mentioned about Ruan leaving the country, <laughs> a bright lad leaving Sri Lanka for pastures. <laughs> and I think I could add to that. They are good to hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold <laughs> on. Yeah, no, no. Uh, Ruan cannot leave whilst they have the A septis. He has to stay in. Oh, the hey, whilst you are still got a, you have a septis at the moment, don't you, in Rowan? <laughs> Rowan? <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. I was about to say that. So you're not allowed to bring that here. Okay? Yeah. That's okay. No worries. All our friends here. No worries. Sati, I, go I, on. I was, I was going to say that there <laughs> had to be a search warrant served on him to get him back there. But anyway, I'll get to the question now. Uh, yeah. Uh, just two questions and perhaps another observation that I might share with everyone here, particularly for the benefit of uh, JICA. Uh, I had a similar experience uh, um, to that of JICA, trying to teach English in uh, the northern part in Jaffna. 
Uh, as you rightly pointed out, John, the fundamental problem there is uh, the lack of confidence. And if you try to improve the situation by trying to encourage them, that is a hard act. They just don't want to know. Uh, it happened uh, with uh, some of the grade two pupils I was trying to teach. Uh, so did it happen with two or three medical students? Because what happens there is, because it's not compulsory, uh, they don't have to learn it. So when opportunities are given, they lack confidence uh, and they essentially, um, you know, just in, get into a corner and not, not make any further efforts. And that's a major problem. Uh, the only time they realize the importance is when they try to get out of the country to come and sit the PLAB examination or try to get into a firm uh, where English is the language uh, uh, spoken. But anyway, that's just an observation. Jacob might find it useful. I think the only way you can address this question is to see them directly and spend time with these children one-to-one. Uh, -one. Otherwise, it's a very difficult exercise. Uh, the question uh, that I have for you, the first one is, I think you mentioned about titanium oxide or dioxide being used in fertilizers. Uh, uh, no, titanium dioxide is used in dyes. So it produces white in dyes. Right. Yeah. So titanium dioxide is a dye. It's a right. pigment used to dye paints, clothes, things like that. Yeah. Okay. I think I misunderstood that because my understanding was that it could be cytotoxic. Am I right? Yes. Yes. But at the moment you're digging it up in its natural form. Yes, which is even worse. So if you have a manufacturing plant here, you have the expertise and then you can start controlling it. OK, once you start, um, once you start a production process, you can start being much, much more careful about toxic waste, toxic handling, etc. But if you are only doing low level unskilled work, who cares? Yeah. Mm. But once you start bringing in middle class workers and, you know, government officials, people start caring a lot more about toxic materials. So I think that production of, for example, titanium dioxide in the country would improve the situation, my personal opinion. Thank you. Uh the next question is uh, about what you said uh, with regards to Cambridge being a pioneer uh, in the area of science parks. And I think you mentioned that uh, they moved into life sciences. Uh, did, did that mean that they abandoned the other aspects, the physical sciences, uh, for the sake of uh, uh, finances? Or is it because physical sciences were taken over by the states? Money. Right. You follow the money. It's, as my grandmother always used to say, you follow the money. The closer you are to the money, the richer you will be. It is better to know money than to have money. Farmer. So that's a bit of a flippant answer because most of the technologies which I grew up in, I'm now 63. So I grew up through the age of web development, app development, internet, and business applications. Okay. They have matured. Okay. They've all matured now. You know, you, how old is Google now? 20 years old? How is Facebook? 20 years old. These technologies have matured. Okay, you hear the one or two bright sparks who suddenly decided, got a little app and he's earned a few million pounds, become a unicorn. But that's, as we say, pigeon feed. It's no money. The technology in web services, the technology in computers is almost dead. Okay. Until we can get quantum 
the <laughs> the money in the world has moved from telecoms. Now telecoms is what we call a cash cow. It brings money in, but from exploiting existing technology. In the biosciences, as we saw during COVID, things are moving rapidly, very, very, very rapidly, okay? So if you want to be in the money, you want to be in pharmacy, in farmers, yes? All the money now for research and development is in pharmacy. So in order to make, to exploit, to make money, you need to be in life sciences. This is not only just in developing drugs, it's also in like we were talking about earlier in improving health sciences. Okay, so for example, I have a friend at the moment who works in Deloitte's and their whole department is based on how do I keep people at home for aftercare services? How do we use technology to keep old people at home and we get them out of the hospitals? And, and you know, spread up the beds. It's important, okay? I am now back into the main thing, so I'll just put you on mute here. So can you hear me now, Rod? Yes, of course. Thank you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. You can sit up there. Yeah. We can yeah, still I see. Need... Uh, yeah. Yeah, let me just turn down the volume one here. Backup one. Yeah. Okay, backup plan. It worked. It, it worked. took too long. Thank it you. It took too long. <laughs> it took too long. So they spend a lot of time doing um, backup services. Okay. So for example, you know, how do I know if somebody falls over? How do I know my heart condition is okay? How do I know they're eating properly? So Deloitte spend a lot of money developing the safe home so we can discharge people from hospital. Okay. And that is the legacy now of those original computing and internet activities, you know. But the real money is in developing drugs. Um, Rowan, as a, as a practicing um, clinician, is bombarded with new drugs. You know, you just think about all the RBNA drugs which have come through after COVID. You know, if it hadn't been for COVID, we'd all be sitting here having clinical trials on all these new drugs. They've all come through. Gene therapy is coming through very, very rapidly. After something which has been a promise on the distance, you know, distant future, it's now here. You know, I go to companies who are quite happily splicing and dicing DNA on a daily basis now. Um, one of my nurses, her partner works for um, CAM Robotics and they can offer robotic surgery just as precisely, okay? We do um, breast cancer investigations much, much more effectively than it can ever be done by a human, yes? These are life sciences. This is where the money is now. So it's where the money is. So the science follows the money. So that is why Cambridge has moved away from things like web services to, to, to life sciences. And that's why I'm using the term life sciences as a very generic term. I'm not talking about pharma. I'm not talking about old age care. I'm talking, we use the phrase life sciences nowadays. Um, but John, if I may, if I may, if, if I may, if I may, John. Uh... Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the sort of thing I had in my mind uh, when I referred to physical sciences was uh, um, study into space science, for example. Now, places like UK don't seem to be on par with uh, the states. 
Uh, and I wondered whether that could be a reason as to why they have opted out of that area, leaving it to the Americans. Well, it's not such a matter of opting out. Remember, money follows money. At the moment, there's very, very little money in space science. Remember the Russians during the Cold War? They poured money into space and into science, into the um, astrophysics and that kind of activity. There's not much money there. Um, you know, our friend at uh, our friend Musk is not making much money on his exploitations in space. He's making his money from other activities. You know, he's making his money from the cars. He's making his money from his other scientific endeavors. So if there is money there, it will come. We take an example of one web, okay? One web. So we develop one web. So although we talk about Musk's and his internet in the sky, one web was there a long time ago, yes? But it's not where there's a lot of money. You know, if you think about the packaging, so if you think about the small satellite packages, you know, you can trace those back to work done by the University of Surrey during the late 1990s. So all your little satellite, you know, the small mini satellites, you know, satellite in a, a briefcase, you can trace all that development back into University of Surrey. But where's the money in it? Where's the money? So that's why I'm a little hesitant about talking about space at the moment. It's not in the right place. It's not in the right place to make money. So that's why I believe we don't have much investment. However, I will say that the UK is the bigger investment in space in the Europe. So although France has the Ariane process and we have the European Space Agency, if you look at the elements and the subcontracts, the majority, not majority, but a very, very high percentage of those contracts for delivering aerospace and aerospace and space technologies are in the UK. Things like the rover, a lot of it's built here. A lot of the service modules are built here. Okay. So a lot of what, and if you think even now about the SLS going around the moon, I'm not sure if it's back yet. Don't forget we have um, Wallace in the spaceship, don't we? Yeah. Thank you, John. Good. Right, we got, uh, I'll go for Sam and Jasmine this time first, and after that, Aja. Sam and Jasmine. Uh, thanks, Ron. Thanks, John. Very entertaining. Uh, you did mention about graphene in your lecture. And I say with the current uh, problem with the energy, I think graphene has a lot to do with uh, solving the energy problem. Is there sufficient or is there any graphene in Sri Lanka? If so, where uh, can we make use of that? Uh, I don't, I have not. I think they used in graphene for one of the examples I mentioned. Because obviously graphene links back into our friend um, Safi, okay, from the University of Surrey. So he is recommending most of the technologies uh, with his advisory group. So yes, I think they are using graphene there, but not in a way we are expecting to use graphene in the UK. So for example, in scrubbing and cleaning, which is obviously the main, element of graphene in the UK, because there's no market for it there. But I do believe they're using graphene, for example, I can't remember the exact details, but yes, I think they are using graphene products here. I can't remember the exact details, I'd have to search that out again. 
Yeah, thank you. I think it's used for mostly batteries and power energy. It's supposed to be the cleanest uh, conductor of uh, electricity. So I'm sort of looking if there is. Yeah. Uh, is there uh, graphene in Sri Lanka? I'm, I'm sure there is, yes. Um, but don't forget, uh, yeah, you said graphene used in battery technology. Mm -hmm. um, but my limited knowledge graphene, I'm not an expert, but where I saw the money, as long as batteries, was in the production of, for example, in hydrogen cells and things like that, yeah. use of uh, power cells for hydrogen, where it's used for separation and cleaning purposes. Also, we use it for say, water purification, saline purification as well. So graphene has a lot, a lot of uses. And something tells me I saw it in the NAN when I was looking over at Slim Tech, and I can't remember why. But yes, I'm sure graphene is being used here. Thank you. Uh, let's go for Aja then. Uh, John, um, uh, about science and money, um, in the last uh, few years, nanotechnology was the in thing. But subsequently, uh, there is much more talk about um, AI uh, uh, as the next uh, big thing. What are your thoughts on that? And where does Sri Lanka okay. come into AI? Okay, they do run courses here in AI, but you have to be careful. Ooh, going back into the 2000s, so if you go about, two, about 2004, in 2004, I was working, oh gosh, with British Airways and another company. And we were introducing the first intelligent voice recognition systems. I was delivering, desperately trying to think of the name of the company, it's in Cambridge, where we were, in, we we're introducing natural voice, okay? And that required AI. So for example, when you called into the BA office, the AI engine told, you were talking to. So it will tell you, you know, what flight you are going on, how your things are doing. So AI is very old hat, okay? Machine learning is where I am. So three years ago, when I was working with Rolls-Royce, I was introducing machine learning into their um, corporate infrastructure. Big, big project. So we were replacing some very, very skilled consultants with computers. So be careful when you talk about AI. AI is old hat. We, we don't invest in AI anymore. We only invest in machine learning, okay? And machine learning will really only take off when we get quantum computing running. So that's at the forefront of technology. So for example, I believe I have seen courses on AI being run in Sri Lanka, okay? But as I mentioned before, one of my goals is to introduce uh, mid 21st century computing into Sri Lanka. So I'm talking about truly intelligent networks. I am talking about introduction of machine learning. I am talking about true, and I repeat true virtual reality, which is where we're all going. Okay, so I do have a goal on, and I was talking about this earlier with a few people in the university here, how we can infiltrate the UGC universities with these new courses and technologies. My initial feeling is I can get them into some of the private universities and then once they are established, move them into the UGC universities at a later time. But this is related to a problem which we were talking about earlier, about a lot of the established universities churning out brilliant doctors, brilliant accountants, brilliant lawyers, but not churning out brilliant entrepreneurs. And until we've sorted that problem out, you know, all this talk about new technologies is 
you know, if I haven't got people to do the work, it's peep, it's pointless trying to introduce them. Okay, Sorry, does that so answer your um, question? Then, yeah, yeah, so, so well, yeah, um, yes, it does. So rather than AI, you are, you're talking about machine intelligence in the future. Very much so. AI is around. Um, you know, you can go to Google and I can get really good AI models running within a few. It's the same. AI is a bit like create. You remember about 20 years ago when we started um, building our first websites, we all sat there with the HD, uh, HTML and we created wonderful websites which look very clunky nowadays. That's where we are with AI. So I can go on to like web Amazon web spaces. I can go into uh, Google Nets, et cetera. And I can get very, very advanced the mature AI engines working for me now. So it's something I can teach, but it's not at the forefront of technology. Thank you. Right, three hours almost. <laughs> oh, I'm off and... sorry. My my study does not have a clock, Kin. And I apologize, Rowan. I forgot to click the box where it says share sound. That's what well, I was going I... to tell you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No worries. We heard you. Uh, most of what you have to say, we heard very well. So this is the time when we want everybody to uh, show yourselves on video and unmute yourself. John, it was a pleasure to have you. And... Uh, we learned a lot which we didn't know about our motherland. Uh, and thank you very much for sharing those lovely views about Sri Lanka. And thank you again for the lovely work you do to our colleagues in Sri Lanka as well. And as usual, we would like to thank you on behalf of the Sri Lankan Literary Society. Thank you, John. Oh, thank you for the opportunity to share some of my knowledge here. It is an uphill struggle to get a lot of my ideas over, but you know me, Rowan. I, I, I have plans. I take my plans in a very disciplined manner. I don't have great expectations. Little by little, I get where I want to go. <laughs> you should, you should advise the cabinet. I think in Sri Lanka. <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Everybody you, everyone, for your patience and for your acceptance of my limited knowledge of Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.